What do Houstonians think about crime? How tolerant are we of other races and lifestyles? And what do we see as the biggest challenge facing our neighborhoods and our city? Tonight, we take a closer look at the 2009 Houston Area Survey. I'm Ernie Manus, and this is Houston 8. Every year since 1982, the Houston Area Survey interviews Harris County residents to find out more about who we are as a community. This might be the longest running continuous public opinion and demographic survey of any city in the world. The survey includes topics such as education, crime, economics, health care, discrimination, immigration, abortion, homosexuality, the environment, and transportation. To help us discuss this survey is the director of the Urban Research Center of Houston at Rice University, Dr. Stephen Kleinberg. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Ernie. Great to be here. You've been doing this survey over so many years now. Do we see a difference in who we are as a people, or has it confirmed that we are the same community? Well, it's been a remarkable 28 years. I was, of course, a very young man when we began this process. <laughs> uh, we did our first survey when the oil boom was going like gangbusters. This was a biracial southern city dominated by white men riding the oil boom to continue prosperity. Two months after that first survey, the oil boom collapsed. We said, my God, we better do this survey again. And for 28 years, and we watched the city go into major recession and then recover into a restructured economy and a demographic revolution. Before we get into the exact things that are in this year's survey mm -hmm. and we get into the nuts and bolts of it all, when you talk about the bust we saw before, the downward slide into the bust, do we see similar things in today's survey? Yes. Uh, one of the, uh, the opening question, the, the open-ended question, we should get our random adult and our random household reached by random telephone numbers. We ask, uh, what would you say is the biggest problem facing people in the Houston area today? And last year, uh, crime was a predominant concern. Traffic was very important. And only 15% only mentioned the economy as the most serious problem. Today, 44% a jump from 15 to 44 percent in one year. The last time we saw anything like that was precisely between 1986 and 1987 when the oil bust totally, when the collapse really occurred right. and the unemployment rate went to 10.1 percent back in 1986. The unemployment rate uh, in February of last year was 4.1 percent and it grew to 6.3 percent. So it's nothing like what it was then, but a shock in terms of the sense of facing serious economic problems in a city that has been doing pretty well until very recently. Now, people can wonder about the survey and what it actually means to us as a community. It is not a magic eight ball. It is not predicting what's going to happen, is it? It is simply a reflection of our opinions and views, not even a reflection of reality, correct? Uh, right. Well, it's a reflection of, it, it is as good a reflection as empirical, professional social science is able to capture from a random sample of Harris County residents, asking people with identical questions over the years, how do you see the world? What's happening in your life? And then watching the world change. So it's not, I tell people, I'm not a futurologist, I'm a presentologist. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not the weatherman. That's you can right. tell you what it's like yesterday and what it's like exactly, right now, but exactly. you can't tell us That's what right. it's going to be. But it, in fact, does give you some real clues as to where we're heading as a, as a city and as a, as a nation. And one more thing before we get into mm -hmm. it all is why is this important to know? Why does it matter how we feel about things as opposed to what it really is? I mean, looking at an unemployment index tells you what the reality of who is unemployed is. Asking me how right. I feel about unemployment, why is that important? To, to, have, to, to have an objective picture of the personal experiences, attitudes and beliefs of Harris County residents to, to, come, to, to add to the, the, the quantitative data that are available in various ways is, I think, uh, enormously valuable. And people have, we've found this to be, a, it's, it's, it's sort of one of the uh, special resources that, that Houston has that has been, I think, of real value to all of us. Okay, to explain to people how you do it, it's a random sampling of people through random phone numbers. Right in categories that are already predetermined, or is it simply just random numbers? Uh, it's, it's this traditional method that is now getting increasingly suspect and difficult, and we're, we're going to have to rethink how to, how to do this, but it's random digit dialing so that every household with a telephone has an exactly equal chance to be called, and then a random adult chosen in each random household. When someone answers the telephone, we say, we're only allowed to interview one adult in each household. For this interview, I need to speak to the adult person who had the most recent birthday. Of all the people 18 years old or older, which one, who had the most recent birthday? Ah, oh, that's my 19-year-old son. 
Uh, great. Can we talk to him? He's not here. Can I answer your questions? No, he's the person we need to talk to. We go after that random adult, that random household. We're running into problems increasingly, of course, of people with, without landlines, cell phones, cell phones yeah. and people who use their t- telephones to monitor their, their phone calls. And, and uh, we, we, our cooperation rate is as high as it's always been. If, we can, if an adult will, if a person will answer the telephone, they will, we say we're calling from Rice University, we're doing our 28th annual study. How'd you get my number? We have a computer that gives us <laughs> random phone. We don't know who you are or where you live, but your views are really important. Won't you help us? Uh, and once people begin the survey, they virtually never break it, it off. It used to be That's about it. 80%, and now it was down to, what, 59% this uh, year? Well, in terms of, of all potential households, it was 75% in the early years. It's now about 35%. So you worry about that. And ultimately, we're going to have to find other... It's, a, it's the great problem of polling, of... of, of uh, uh, the whole survey research business. And but doing it that way, demographic breakup. Do you find that you're hitting the percentage of whites in the population, you get that percentage in your survey, percentage of blacks. Is that something you're concerned that about? We're con- I'm concerned about it because I was trained to say that anything under 70% is not, you can't trust. But it's remarkable how, in fact, we get a very good representative sample. We, you know, the, In terms of the things we know about. And you think about, well, who's not going to answer your telephones? Rich people who don't want to have it, deal with you asking for money. Poor people who don't want creditors calling. Young people who are, I'm too busy to fool with service. Older people who say, oh, honey, I have no opinions, call somebody else. So it turns <laughs> out it turns out that the, the questions we ask give a picture that seems to be as, re- as representative and as reliable today as it was when we were getting 75%. Okay, enough of the nuts and bolts. Okay. Find out what you found out this year. We start off, what do Houstonians think about crime? That was where we started with our open of the show. Right, and crime was a growing concern and remains a concern. But there is something about the preoccupation with the economy that makes it harder to sort of focus on other things as well. And when we ask people, how worried are you personally that you or a member of your family will be the victim of a crime? The percent today has gone down from what it was last year. We ask people, uh, has traffic gotten better, worse, or stayed about the same? Percent saying that traffic has gotten worse has gone down slightly from what it had been before. Uh, Has air pollution in the Houston area gotten better or worse in the last three years? Percent saying it's gotten worse has also gone down. So there's less concern in, in the immediate preoccupation with traffic or crime or pollution and enormous concern with the economy. Okay, now I'm a little worried that you have become so popular and this survey has become so important to our city that when something comes out like this that says po- that pollution is less of a concern, where it might still be a major mm-hmm, concern mm-hmm. to the people of this area, that government reaction to it's going to be different, funding is going to change, that actually saying this is what's on the mind of the people, whether it's the right. most important right. thing, and you could be changing That's an interesting, because on the other hand, uh, it does say we've been making some progress on air pollution in the city. This is critical mm-hmm. to Houston's future. This city will not make it in attracting the talent that will grow the businesses of the knowledge economy in the 21st century if it is perceived to be ugly, flat, and dangerously polluted. So we've understood that, and we've been making, the business community and all of us have been making major efforts to improve air quality, to plant more trees, to revitalize downtown. And this, I think, tells us we're on the right track. We're making some progress. The percentage who are concerned remains very high, but not as high as it was last year or the year before. What surprised you the most in this year's survey? Um, it's hard. That's hard to say. I mean, it's, it's sort of. There's always surprise. I think what surprised me the most uh, was not that there was this major increase in concern about the the economy, which, as I say, the unemployment rate went from 4.1 percent to 6.3 percent from last year to this year. But when we asked people. How would you rate the Houston area in general as a place to live? We said, we, 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 compared to most other metropolitan areas, we just say the Houston area is a much better place, a slightly better place, a slightly worse place, or a much worse place in which to live. What is striking over the years has been people complain about traffic, they complain about pollution, they complain about crime. You ask them, what's Houston like to live in? They say it's a wonderful place to live. And so the percentage saying it's, it's uh, be- much better, slightly better or much better has stayed high. But there was a jump from 32% to 44% saying it's a much better place to live than anywhere else in the country. And that was a surprise. And I think it reflects two things. Number one is that sense that bad as things are here, it's a whole lot better than in most other parts of the country. 6.3% unemployment in Houston, 8.2% unemployment nationwide, 10.3% unemployment in Michigan. Right. Six point, so, so there's that clear percent. And, that's, and, and, and that perception that that, that combination in Houston of concern and optimism is something that we, has become a kind of a part, a part and parcel of the Houston psyche. The, the, the one question that the Greater Houston Partnership 
always asks me about every year. How's our question doing? It's a question we've been asking every other year that says, do you agree or disagree with this statement? If you work hard in this city, eventually you will succeed. And 87% this year, despite the economic collapse concerns, have said, uh, uh, agreed, yes, if you work hard in this city, you can succeed, eventually at least. Has and that it's been that, an upward trend? And, and that's, that that's been back and forth, but slightly upward. It was 81% in, in 2005, 87% today, and higher than in the nation as a whole. When, in national polls, when people are asked, do you think it's generally true if you work hard in this country, eventually you will succeed? About between 58 and 60, 65% of Americans say, yes, I believe that's true. In Houston, even at the depths of the recession in 1986, 87, never fell below 80%. Wow. Or 75%, that's, I guess, was the lowest. And now 87%. You talk about, which kind of fascinates me in, in your summation of the report, that you can look at different categories and they will answer in certain ways. You can see the difference between how a rich person would answer and a poor person, how a black or a white, immigrant or native born, young sure. or old. Oh, you bet. That's the richness of this, is, is the variety of, of ways of understanding the world. And they sure. do fall into these categories clearly enough that you can see who's who. Uh, well, if these are enormously interesting sociological categories that remind us that we live in a world that is to an important extent our own construction. We construct reality. We, we perceive the world through the lenses of our experience. And that world looks different. So you ask a question of African Americans about, about the per persistence of discrimination, for example, and African Americans see discrimination that Anglos think no longer exists. And, it, and you can see these striking differences in the, in the lived experience that different yeah. people have. Can you look at one of these survey sets of answers and without knowing indicators of the demographic of who answered it, pretty much make a good guess at who this person is an answer? You make a guess. I mean, the, the richness and, and what's fascinating about the human experience is the irreducible freedom, right? People who are fit into all these categories can still fool you, right? So, so but there are patterns, and the patterns are not random, and, there are, there, and that's, that's, what's, that's the job of the sociologists and the social scientists, to pull out those patterns. So what are the patterns here those, that you notice? Those structures. Uh, about what? About the broader Across changes? The board. Or? Uh, let's say young to old. What are you noticing different in the younger generation that's answering Some the questions? Some very the interesting questions that reflect uh, the world that the, the, people talk about that first world that you experience when you're growing up, when you reach the age of your first movement into adulthood at the age of 20. That world is the world that you experience as if it was the only possible world. And later experiences are all superimposed on that first world, and, and there's a basic kind of human experience that what we are familiar with feels natural, and what we're unfamiliar with feels unnatural. And so as young people coming of age in the 21st century are experiencing a very different world than those who came of age in the, in the, in the middle of the 20th century or, or later on. And so questions about comfort with diversity, questions about attitudes toward gay rights, are just dramatically different by age. And, and that tells you you're in the presence of, of a pattern that is likely to predominate as social change occurs. One of the most interesting findings over the years has been we've asked questions about abortion rights and gay rights all the way along. There has been absolutely no change in attitudes toward abortion rights. People over uh, the same proportion today as, as 20 years ago believe that abortion is morally wrong or morally acceptable. The same proportion uh, are in favor or opposed to a law that would make it more difficult for a woman to obtain an abortion. No changes. What is striking there, by the way, a quick aside, is that you have this wonderfully interesting group of about 20 percent of Houstonians who are tolerant traditionalists who say, I believe abortion is morally wrong, but a woman has to make that decision herself. That awareness that the world is an enormously complex place and a decision that I would never make in my life ought not to be imposed on everybody regardless of what their experience is. I and that's been, that's been interesting. See, that has not changed over time. But yeah, I was fascinated important. about the abortion rights yeah. question mm -hmm. and how it played out and that it has stayed the same. Right. Yet, when you look at the homosexual rights area... Every single question has changed. They become yeah. much more liberal right. and accepting right. there, but we stay hold true to what we believed right. before for abortion. That's Why right. do you think that That's is? Right. Well, there's several things here. One is, back to our earlier question, no relationship with age in attitudes toward abortion. Very powerful relationship with age in attitudes toward gay rights. Younger, younger people of all ethnicities are far more in support of gay rights than older people. No, no difference... Uh, on abortion issues. So that, that's one piece that tells you why one might be changing and the other not, right, as the inevitable right. process occurs of younger people. But, but why? But, why would that well, be? Uh, several key, key, key questions. One was, do you believe that abortion, that I'm sorry, do you believe that homosexuality is something people choose or something they cannot change?
And the belief that it is something people choose says, well, that's a moral choice and it's right, right or wrong. If it's a belief that people, it's something people cannot change, then it becomes part of the natural human variation. That's, you know, and, and the b- belief that it's something that people cannot change has gone up consistently and significantly. So the, then that leads the, to more liberal attitude that, on it that because now to, it's something inherent. And it, and it ties into this broader <clears throat> transformation in Houston as we become one of the most ethnically diverse cities in the country. We're getting used to the idea, well, not everybody's going to look like me. Not everybody I work with is going to have the same, the same attitudes and perceptions as I have, and not all of them are going to have the same proclivities as me, and that's okay. I can handle that. I can, and in fact, it increases the value and the richness of my experience. But then flip it over now to abortion. Why are we not seeing a change there with the younger generation? It's a great question. I think, I think abortion is a, is a behavior, a choice, an, attitude, uh, uh, an action that you either take or don't take that's quite different from this growing belief that Gay, that homosexuality is a part of the natural human variation. No one chooses to be gay. No, and, 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 that, and, and the other key predictor of attitudes th- toward, toward gay rights is, do you have a personal friend who's gay or lesbian? And that has gone from 40% to 60%. Do you ask and if a you know predictor. somebody who has had an abortion? Is that part of the We have question? not asked that question. So I'd be curious to could, see yeah. if you know someone who's experienced, does that change your views on how it is? And... And I wouldn't even be able to presuppose yeah. at this point which way that would be. Right, right. No, we would assume that, the, yeah. that that would. But, but it is, it is an interesting. And I th- as I say, what I think was most interesting about the abortion issues is, is two things. One is that they, they haven't changed, but the other is this, this tolerant traditionalist. And the third thing is we've asked people uh, during every election year, we said, suppose there was a candidate running for the legislature whose views you mostly agreed with, but who took a position on abortion rights that you disagreed with completely. Would you certainly not vote for that candidate? Probably not. Or could you still vote for that candidate? And the percentage of both pro-life and pro-choice people who said they would certainly not vote for a candidate who disagreed with them has gone down significantly in both groups from 2004 to 2008. So it's become somewhat less salient as a dominating concern, Uh, partly, I think, because of this. If there's a single fact that is central to Houston in the 21st century, it is that we are going to become increasingly diverse, multi-ethnic, variegated, heterogeneous. No longer are we this southern city dominated by white men. We are a part of a, a microcosm of the world. And as people get more comfortable with that, they're more comfortable with the recognition not everybody's going to make the same choices that I make. And, they don't, and part of it is because it's not that they're bad people and I'm a good person. It's because they, li- they, they experience different realities. Okay, another area that fascinated <laughs> me in reading over the study is the problems facing America... People saying that the reason we have problems is either moral decline mm-hmm. or the economic yes. issue. Yeah. And even though, as I understand it, the people who believe it's moral decline has gone down in the pa- from the past, it's still at about 50%, right. Right. which is a very scary thought, yeah. I think. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's been very interesting. I mean, that's, that's the dominant American belief has always been, you know, this is a, this is a just world, uh, the pre- free enterprise system produces fair outcomes, and if you don't make it, it's your own fault. And so a question that said, for example, do most poor people in America today, are most poor people in America today poor because they don't work hard enough or because of circumstances they can't control? That, too, has shifted from overwhelming belief that they're not working hard enough to a, something like a 50-50, a slightly higher, saying circumstances they can't control. The problems we face are now perceived more to be economic problems than moral problems. Um, and that ties into this experience of the nation having gone through really 20 to 25 years of uh, absolute belief that government is the problem, get government off our backs, the free enterprise system always does things right, mm-hmm. to a recognition there are serious challenges here. And government, you turn to government to, as a, that it has an affirmative role to play in economic justice. And so you can, we, we have a question tied into that that we asked over the years. Said, uh, is government trying to do too many things that should be left to individuals or businesses? Or do you believe instead that government should do more to solve our country's problems? The percent saying it should do more to solve our country's problems has also gone up significantly. And then, then, then your other up, point is it's still only a 50-50 split. <laughs> as that goes up, do we also see a proportion of people that claim that they are Republican or Democrat? Does that hold still true to what we see as liberal ideas and conservative ideas? If the populace is more liberal, do we see a higher percentage of people claiming to be Democrats? If we see it more conservative, do we see... Is that still the political tied? divisions are dramatic? Uh, the polarization of the population it mirrors the polarization in Congress, uh, and on exactly those questions, absolute. The single we've 
every, we put all the predictors in, nothing touches. Are you, do, you, are you, do you feel close to the Republican Party or close to the Democratic Party on precisely those questions? And what happened in Harris County was that this was an overwhelming, not overwhelmingly, but absolutely consistently and clearly a Republican county and, uh, with 48 percent Republican, 44 percent Democrat. And, and uh, then in 2006, from 2005 to 2006, there was a major shift. And we became a much more Democratic Party county than Republican. And, and since then, the curves are coming back together. But we're still now, since 2006, this is a Democratic county as opposed to Republican county, but, but closer to 50-50 than it has been. Does that tie in also then with religious secular? Do we see, as it becomes more Democratic, less people saying that they are religious? Is there any connection there? No, we, and we don't see that. We remain mm -hmm. very religious. We remain, uh, in fact, more people say religion is very important in my life today than they did 10 or 15 years ago. What has changed is that we're no longer overwhelmingly Protestant, right? We were an overwhelmingly Protestant community during the, during the 80s and early 90s. And then with, the, with the, the, the Anglo population that was pouring into Houston during the oil boom stopped coming and all the growth has been immigration from Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean and the children of immigrants. There's been a, a, a movement from, from about 20% to 35% who are Catholic and a tripling in the percentage of people who told us they were Muslim, Buddhist, or Hindu, right? So we're, moving, we're becoming, just as we're a microcosm of the world's ethnicities, we are, we are increasingly in Houston a microcosm of the world's religions. Another thing that fascinates me, I know going through the whole mass transit and the birth of light rail and all of that through here, we heard so many people, it's not going to work, don't do it, shouldn't do it. You're not seeing that in the study now. People well, are that's changing been, their views. That's been one of, the, one of the sea changes. And the great value of having d done this survey for so many years is that you can watch sort of secular paradigm shifts take place. And there's one of them. During the 80s and early 90s, the, you know, this was a city built by Ford on behalf of the automobile, made possible by air conditioning, and it spread everywhere. It was the most least dense major city in America, one-third the density of Los Angeles. The greater Houston metropolitan area, the 10-county area that the census is, is the metropolitan area of Houston, covers a geographical space larger than the state of Massachusetts. This is the blob that ate East Texas, yeah. right? Built by the automobile. And so always the notion was you deal with traffic by building more roads. And, and mass transit is never going to work for anybody. And that has, 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 we've seen a paradigm shift where, where now when we ask people what's the best solution to traffic in Houston, 50% say making major improvements in mass transit, only 23% say build more roads. So it's a, and, that's, and, and that's been a striking trend and change now, over time. Now, candidates, I'm assuming, and politicians can use this report to figure the pace and the feeling of their constituents at this point. So will we see more money for light rail coming out of, a, of research like yours? Does that, do those things tie I together? Mean, I, yeah, I mean, politicians have their, uh, nose, their, their fingers on the pulses. But I think what these surveys do because of the objectivity and the, and the clarity of change and, you know, having this over time is it, it confirms, it clarifies. It's, of course, no, no politician is going to not be in favor of light rail and, and better transit as one in component of a solution to trans, 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 transit in a way that 10 years ago there was, real, it was really right. much more problematic. In the same way, I think no one is going to vote, uh, uh, no candidate who is openly gay is going to be disqualified from running for office or, or unlikely to win because of that in a way that not that long ago, 1985, remember, 82 percent came out and voted against the most minimal kind of non-discrimination against gays who applying for jobs in the, in, in the city. Before we run out of time, though, I do want to mention the Urban Research Center of Houston. That's Thank you. Where this is all leading to now for you. Well, this has been uh, a, a, a wonderful experience of me and my undergraduate students you know, doing yeah. this survey each year. And, and Rice has is, is, is committed to and recognized that we need to make sure that the survey continues. And we want to make sure that it becomes far more widely available and useful. And you were touching at the beginning of this incredibly rich data that we have. We have interviewed 7,000 African Americans over the last 10 years, randomly, a representative sample, 7,000 Latinos. We have such incredibly rich data that I can only touch on a little piece of that. We are going to build a research, an urban research center that will be a permanent home for the Houston Area Survey and maximize its access to that data and other research to the wider community to inform and inspire the communities on which the, the, this research is based. And are you already starting on the next one yet? 
So we're, we're how long do you take between them? <laughs> we wait for a little while. We try to consolidate this one first. <laughs> and I do want to give a shout out to U of H because they do all the calling out of here. They do correct? indeed, and they do a wonderful job. Yes, yeah. Dr. Kleinberg, thank you so much for coming in and thank sharing you. this with us. And I hope you'll come back next year with the next survey. We'll, we'll see how pleasure. we've changed. Okay. Now, each week we invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Simply click on the Houston 8 banner, and you can join our online community. Read about our guests, learn more about the topic, share your thoughts and ideas, and even suggest questions that we might ask during upcoming episodes. Remember, information posted on our website might be used on air, so keep that in mind when submitting. That does it for us tonight. Join us back here next week. Until then, I'm Ernie Manoos. Have a great week.